of all the organizers for inviting me to give these lectures. Um, so I was asked to give lectures about in, an introduction to supersymmetric Wilson loops and their role in localization and holography. So this is what I'm going to do. And uh, before I start on the blackboard, let me just give you a roadmap and overview of big conceptual ideas uh, using slides. Also, uh, if you don't want to, you don't need to take notes because my notes are all already online, so you can just maybe, I don't know, print them out and follow or whatever. Okay, so uh, <coughs> Wilson loop is a crucial central object in, uh, in, in quantum field theory uh, and holography. And uh, you, you know, just to have a, remi to remind ourselves, uh, we already, we had the first encounter with a Wilson loop in quantum mechanics when we uh, study uh, bohm aronoff and in QED when we study these gauge compensators. And uh, uh, then you go to lattice theories and then you see that Wilson loops are important uh, tools to diagnose the presence of confinement. And uh, if you study mathematics, you know that there is a relation with not invariance in three dimensions. This is how Witten got his Fields Medal in 1990. And also, uh, going back to quantum field to, 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 to physics, they, they are very important to testing for testing non-perturbative dualities like S-duality or electromagnetic duality because there is a relation between this uh, electric object, the Wilson loop, and its magnetic counterpart counterpart, which is the Toft loop. And uh, so you can, you can use the two computations of the two objects to, to test this duality. But uh, uh, also in string theory, of course, they are ubiquitous. They appear all the time. But of course, this is a school on localization and holography. And of course, with some loops have to do with, uh, with uh, supersymmetric localization. And uh, the uh, the way they enter in this, in this picture is because they can be computed exactly using localization and uh, uh, in particular using matrix models, which is what the quantum field theory path integral reduces to after localization. And so they give you exact results. Okay, so having exact results in a quantum field theory is something very rare, very, uh, of course, non-trivial. Non and very powerful because now uh, with these exact results you can really test holography uh, which is again a weak strong coupling duality like as duality so you really have to have control over one side of the duality very precisely or even exactly in order to to be able to 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 test non-trivially these, these dualities and uh, so in holography there's lots of different uh, aspects of uh, Wilson loop that are important. So, okay, they can give you precision tests. And also, they, uh, uh, you have many uh, interesting objects that appear. So you have minimal surfaces, you have deep brains, you have bubbling geometries, so fully back-reacted geometries that can all, that can all be used to, 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 uh, um, to test holography, and they have a, they have a duality with Wilson loops. Okay, so <clears throat> of course there's also another big part of, uh, of the literature having to do with uh, computing scattering amplitudes through at strong coupling using Wilson loops. And of course this is also very important. But okay, so what uh, uh, we're going to focus on is these two, blo uh, these two blocks. So there's going to be a part one, which is Wilson loops in supersymmetric gauge theories. And then, so this is going to be the subject of today and maybe tomorrow. And then we are going to uh, move to the gravitational side of this holographic duality. And we are going to see what these results that we obtain here, uh, how these results can be checked in holography and what they imply in holography and so on, okay? So this is uh, uh, everything I, I, I wanted to, to, to to say with slides, so that you have a, a big, uh, at least a big picture of what we're going to do. So we're going to start with this, and then the last two lectures we're going to do uh, the holographic side. And also I'm going to, maybe in the last lecture, if time permits, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about some other kinds of operators that uh, 
I'm going to leave for last, okay? Anyway, so if there's any question, please uh, interrupt and, uh, and ask. Okay? Good, so... Um, <clears throat> So before we venture into supersymmetric territory, so it's, uh, I guess, always nice to review a bit uh, uh, what we know. So review Wilson loops in gauge theories. And as I told you, so the first place where you encounter Wilson loops is in QED where they appear as, uh, uh, well, Wilson lines more precisely, where they appear as gauge compensators, or if you want to think more in geometric terms, as parallel transporters. Okay, so you have, um, you have some object that, uh, let me call it U gamma of Y X, which is the exponent of IE and the holonomy of the connection, well, the, the, the integral of the connection along gamma, so gamma is some contour going from X to Y. And uh, so this guy is, uh, is uh, nice because uh, it allows you to define a covariant derivative which transforms nicely under, under a gauge transformation. So if you have some, some field transforming like E to the I alpha X, uh, phi of x, uh, you can also, you can define a covariant derivative which also transforms in the, in the same way. Uh, because this guy transforms as e to the i alpha y u gamma Y x e to minus i alpha x. Okay, so uh, this object depends on the on the path gamma that you are taking to go from x to y, unless the uh, field A is a, is a is a pure gauge. So unless f mu nu is equal to zero. Okay, and what is the physical meaning of this object is. Uh, So if you take the expectation value of this uh, of this object, essentially you discover that this is uh, the phase acquired by a particle which has charge E. Uh, going along gamma. Okay, so this is just the interaction term between uh, between uh, uh, between the particle and the and the and the gauge field, the, the background field. Okay, and this phase is, uh, as you know from quantum mechanics, is observable in some situation, like when you have a non-simply connected space-time, like for example, you have some solenoid with some magnetic field, in, like in the bohm aronov uh, experiment, you can, you, can, uh, you can detect physically this, uh, this, this, uh, this phase by doing some uh, interference experiment, okay? Okay, so this is UED, then you can go to young males, and uh, we want to define a non-abelian extension of this guy and uh, uh, so we have u gamma, y, and x, which is defined as the part ordering. So now let me call g the coupling constant. And now this guy is some field with a mu a x t a, okay? some generator of a group, so you, you have some group G, 
So let's take, for example, G is equal. Most most of the of the time we're going to we're going to think about G as being S U N. Okay, and uh, okay. So now we have this. We have matrices in the exponent, and so we have to worry about what it means to take the exponent of these matrices. And this is why we introduce this path ordering symbol, which you can think of it this way. So first of all, let me let me pick some parameter along uh, the curve. And now I can think of this path ordering as the products f zero to tau one plus i g c dot mu s a mu c of s. Okay. So under a gauge transformation, now we have the same structure, except that now instead of having just exponents of functions, we have, uh, so if we have some gauge transformation omega, we have that this u of gamma of x and, and y x transforms like omega y, u gamma y x, omega dog of x. Okay? Okay, so you see that this guy is not gauge invariant, but we can uh, um, find some gauge invariant object out of it, so which is just take a closed loop. So take x equal to y and take the trace. So if you do that, you get, uh, you get a gauge invariant uh, Object. Um, okay, so I need more chalk. Uh, I think that's enough. Okay, so um, now let me let me let me. Write it down. So now let me define this guy as trace, but ordered exponential ig integral over a close contour dz mu a mu of z. Okay, so uh, we see then that uh, so this guy it depends on the contour c that I'm that I'm considering. And also, I could do something more general, actually, than just coupling the theory, young mill theory, to some fundamental particle. I don't need to do that. Well, this is, some, this is what you usually do because you always think about quarks. Uh, but you can take this uh, in a different representation of the gauge group. And then you could... Uh, you could t take this trace in this, in this other representation. So this is, uh, so we, we see that this also depends on the choice of representation that you, that you, that you are considering. So this is not something that you usually do in, in, uh, in Young Mills, but actually I can give you an example of a paper where, so this was done, is there's, for one example is some, some work by, uh, Schiffman and collaborators, 0307097, where you say, okay, so for SU3, the uh, rank two antisymmetric representation is like a fundamental representation, so you could think of quarks transforming in this representation, and, and they have done it. So uh, this is Armoni, Schiffman, and, and, somebody, and somebody else, okay? So again, it's not something that you usually do in quantum field theory, but this is going to be actually very nice for us in holography because this is going to be like an extra parameter that we have to explore uh, uh, interesting things in holography, like these D-brains, 
and these bubbling geometries that I was mentioning, that I'm mentioning here, they, they, they are explored precisely by changing this representation. Okay, and also the nice thing is that supersymmetric localization does not depend on representation. So, it, so you prove it for the fundamental representation, for Wilson looping and fundamental representation, it carries over for any representation. And so you can, you can use the same techniques also for, for higher representations, okay? Of course, as you know from lattice theory, some contours are particularly interesting, like these rectangular contours, which can give you indications of uh, confinement, deconfinement transitions, and so on. Okay, okay so this is what all I wanted to, to say about, uh, about uh, a review, just essentially to write down this formula so that we, 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 we have a starting point. Okay? Very good, so now let's move on to, the, to, the, to part one, to the supersymmetric <coughs> discussion, uh, uh, Wilson loops in supersymmetric gauge theories. So let me start with some uh, uh, generalities and conventions. Okay, so uh, I, I decided to, to do one example with details rather than doing a survey of many examples with less details. And uh, the example which is the easiest to talk about is, is n equal to four super young males with uh, gauge group SUN, okay, in, uh, in, uh, in D equal to four. But essentially, uh, everything I'm going to talk about has counterparts for many other examples, uh, most notably in three dimensions, in this ABJM theories or Chern-Simon matter theory with various degrees of supersymmetry. You can, you can carry over many, many of the, of the things that I'm going to say. Okay, but this is the example which is, which is I guess, more pedagogical because it's simple and uh, people I mean, we can do computations in, uh, in, great, uh, in great detail and compute things exactly and so on. Okay, so let me remind you, so what are the fields of the theory? So we have a gauge field, a mu, then we have uh, six scalars, phi i, so this, this is a singlet of SO6R. This is vector of SO6R. And then we have alpha equal to one, four, and A equal to one and four. And this is a four of SO6R, okay? And uh, okay, I, I can write the action, but I don't need to. So I'm going to, I'm going to be in Euclidean signature most essentially always. And um, <clears throat> so it's uh, particularly convenient to um, recast this. Uh, so we have, we have four spinners that uh, is nice to recast in terms of a single Majorana vial spinner in 10 dimensions, okay? So these are, these are 16 components. And now, the, uh, so if you write down the action, you find that there are some gamma matrices, mm -hmm. gamma M, that can be, uh, so we, which are 16 by 16. which obey a Clifford algebra, gamma n, gamma n equal to delta mn. Okay, so now the, uh, the n equal to four uh, action is invariant under the following transformations. 
So we have two sets of transformation that Q Okay, and then there is uh, transformations for the fermions that I, I don't need. So this is this plus the, 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 the transformation for, the, for, for psi that I don't need. And also there is another set of transformation that I call delta S, which is epsilon bar S. I got the same thing with X mu gamma nu. plus a corresponding transformation for psi. Okay, so we have now epsilon Q and epsilon S are two constant. My Urana vial spinors in, uh, in, uh, in 10 dimensions, so they have 16 components each. Okay, and I can, uh, I can, uh, combine them into a single epsilon, which is an epsilon Q plus X nu gamma nu epsilon S, which is a super conformal killing spinner, okay? Okay, good, so now um, it simplifies computations a little bit if I, if I actually change a little bit this convention, this, uh, this notation. Um, and actually, so let me think of, link, let me think about gamma, gamma mu as something which acts on alpha only, not A. So it only acts on the Dirac index and uh, instead of using gamma i, let me use gamma five rho i, where rho i acts on a, not alpha. So, I mean, another way, so gamma five is minus gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four. So gamma mu are the SO4, the Ubeian SO4 Clifford algebra, and rho i, they obey an SO6, Clifford algebra, and the two guys commute. So gamma mu rho i is equal to zero. So this simplifies uh, the analysis, okay? Okay, so this is everything I, I need about uh, <coughs> conventions. So let me propose an answer for a supersymmetric Wilson loop. Okay, so I, 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 I don't know in general how to define a Wilson loop in a supersymmetric theory, so I have to think a little bit uh, uh, about a possible answers, something that has a chance to work. And uh, uh, the obvious idea is that we need to include phi i's in the exponent. So in a, in a non-supersymmetric gauge theories, we had uh, the definition that I just erased, e to the i integral a, so there was only the gauge field. Now we have, in the same gauge multiplet, we have the gauge field, we have the scalars, and we have the fermions, okay? Okay, so you could say, okay, maybe I, I also need to include psi a because we are in this, they are in the same multiplet, and yes, maybe in principle you should, but including phi i in this particular case is, is enough. And, and now let me try to, to motivate why this is, this is uh, so let me justify this strategy. Well, so the first point is that phi i 
is in the same multiple at as a mu, so I should treat it, I should treat them more or less on the same footing. And then I'm looking at this, uh, I'm looking at these uh, transformations here, and then I see, okay, of course, if I have only a, a mu, I'm going to produce a variation of a Wilson loop which is non-zero, but proportional to this big psi. Of course, if I include also phi i, maybe I've got a chance to cancel the two variations. Okay, so, so um, delta epsilon of phi has a chance to cancel delta epsilon of a mu, right? And then there is another, uh, another justification, which is uh, the fact that d equal to four and equal to four super young mills can be seen as a dimensional reduction of uh, d equal to 10 and equal to one super young mills. So in a sense, we already had a taste for this reduction because I already arranged the, the, the fermions in terms of a single majorana vial spinner in 10 dimensions. <clears throat> but also, you see that these two guys, uh, a mu and phi i, originate from, from a single gauge field in 10 dimension that after I do the reduction, this remains a gauge field, this, this remains a vector field, and, and these, these phi i's are just a bunch of uh, scalars, okay? So since I got, so if I think of, if I, if I think of, uh, um, so if I think of a, a m like this and big X m as uh, some x mu y i, so I got some contour in space time and in some internal space, then I got the, the natural starting point in 10 dimension would be a m d big X m, and so this would be a mu d x mu plus phi i d y i, so I, I see that there is a natural, uh, so this is, this is, including phi is, is something very natural, is something that you, you, you do very naturally. So you think of enlarging your contour from being purely space-time to being space-time plus some internal component, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> with this, modific with, with this uh, justification, let me write down the answers. So now I got uh, a Wilson loop is going to depend on the representation R, it's going to depend on the contour, and it's going to depend on this internal contour, I, I, I call it theta. So this is one of the, some normalization factor. Okay, so this is my answer. I, 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 so up to here was the same thing as before. Now we included some, we included, we included the scalar. I just write down this x dot explicitly to, to, to make it clear that this is reparameterization, reparameterization invariant. And then I, I call the couplings of the scalars theta i. Okay, and again, this is in Euclidean signature. Okay, so essentially the supersymmetry analysis is independent of the representation. So if you, if you prove that something is supersymmetric for the fundamental representation, it's going to be supersymmetric for any representation. So for now, let's just fix the representation to be a fundamental one. 
And so we have two unknowns, which are C and theta i. So we need to solve for these unknowns in order to have a supersymmetric Wilson loop. OK? So is it clear? So it's going to be clear in a moment that R doesn't play any role in the supersymmetry analysis. Only, only C and theta is what you need to determine. Good. <clears throat> Good, so now let's see, let's see the supersymmetry variation of, uh, of this guy. So this is uh, the, the dimension of the fundamental representation is just n. Try spot ordering. D tau. Epsilon bar. I guess there's a psi. Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you what I've done. So I took so I took the variation of the Wilson loop. So the variation, these, these two variations, they act on the exponent, and they bring down this piece. So this is the variation of the gauge field, and this is the variation of the scalars. But I already write down with these new notations in which instead of having the gamma i, which aren't I commute with the gamma mu, I, 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 I take this gamma 5 explicit, and then I got rho i instead of gamma i. OK? This is what I explained before. So, so your contour is in space time. So we should not consider in the internet space as well? Yeah, so the contour, so this part is in space time, and this part is, is in some internal space. I still don't know what theta i is at this point. But c the Oh, no, OK. So s is the common parameter for the two. So if you want, you have x mu s and theta i s. So it's the common parameterization of the two contours. I don't know what they are. What is the rho? Rho i, rho i, right? Sorry. So rho i is uh, what I, so instead of using, instead of using uh, gamma i, which was, a 10 dimension, it was a gamma matrix in SO10, uh, Clifford, uh, obeying the Clifford algebra for SO10, I use uh, gamma 5 rho i, where rho i now is an SO6 Clifford. It, they, they, all, all of them are 16 by 16 matrices, but it's nice because now I got that rho i and gamma mu commute. Still, gamma i anti-commute with gamma mu, but because there's, a, there's a gamma, extra gamma phi. Good, OK, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the variation of the Wilson loop. OK, so now the simplest strategy, so, and we want this to be 0, right? So we want this to be 0. So in this particular example of n equal to 4 superior mills, a, a strategy that works is just to require that this is 0. So if this is 0, of course, this is enough to be 0. But so in other theories, it doesn't work this way. So in other theories, you have to do more complicated things. So like things have to mix in a, in a, in a, in a complicated way. But in this particular 
um, case, this is, this is enough. So the strategy is make this guy to be zero. So for example, in, in ABJM theory, things are more complicated. First of all, it's not, so okay, you could do that, but you don't get, you don't get the most important Wilson loop, which is the most supersymmetric Wilson loop. You don't get it this way. You have, to, you have to do another construction where you also include fermions in the exponent, and then you have to expand the exponential in some Taylor expansion, and then the variation of the bilinear of the fermions cancel with the variation is, is a more complicated construction. But in this case, this is, this is, this is enough to, to get everything, okay? Okay, so we want this to be, to be zero. Okay, the first observation is that if theta i, theta i is a unit norm vector, then we get that i x mu gamma mu plus, so we get that this guy squared is zero. So this, this, this operator is, is squared to zero, so it is degenerate, and I can use it to build projectors, okay? You? Yes. No, I think that's, that's, that's enough, but. Enough? So the, the idea was to look, you can rewrite it that way? Yes, yes. Delta sub C of W is delta H of W for some gauge variety? Yes, yes. That's the most general position. All the way to look for into that. Oh, okay, I, I'm not sure. So there is a classification with, by Dimarski and Perstun, and I, I don't remember if they use this, this, this idea, but. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the most generic classification that you could. Okay, so now we have this, uh, this operator that squares to zero, so you can, see, you can see it immediately. Okay, because, uh, uh, so essentially you get an x squared from, v so the cross terms cancel precisely because of the commutation between rho, rho i and gamma mu. And then um, you have this uh, uh, i x squared, so that gives you minus x dot squared, and then you get a plus x dot squared multiplied by theta i squared. And if theta i squared is one, things cancel. <clears throat> okay, so. <clears throat> So given this, um, so you can easily check it. So let me define projector p plus minus to be given by this. Okay, so you can, you can easily prove that p plus minus squared is p plus minus, and p plus p minus equal to p minus p plus is equal to zero. And now we see that this particular combination that appears here is essentially proportional to p plus. So we can, you can prove, you can see easily that this is proportional to epsilon bar p plus x dot mu gamma mu big psi. Okay, so, and we want this to be zero. So this is, this is, uh, this is the condition. So then it's clear that any 
epsilon bar, which has the form of some epsilon bar zero, P minus is going to be a half rank solution. So this is going to So this is a project, so half of, the, half of the components of epsilon are going to be preserved in this way, okay? So if we find an epsilon of this form, this is going to preserve half of the, half of the supersymmetries. Okay? Good, so but now, now there is a crucial observation, namely, <clears throat> so these projectors, they depend on x, x dot, okay? So they depend on the point in the contour in which, in which you are. So if you move from one point to the next point, you change the projector and you change the equations. And so at, at different points, you are going to preserve different components of epsilon. So you're going to preserve different supersymmetries at different points in the loop. And uh, this, uh, this is not a symmetry of of the action of n equal to four superior mills, which is a rigid supersymmetric action. Rigidly supersymmetric action is not a supergravity action, okay? So uh, this, is, this would be only local supersymmetry, but now we have to preserve rigid supersymmetries. And so we have to, so but we want rigid supersymmetry And so we want uh, the same condition at any point of the loop S, okay? So we, we want to preserve always the same components of epsilon. Okay, so now let's go on and find the solutions or some solutions. So uh, a, f a first solution is a straight line in the four direction. So let me take x mu equal to zero, zero, zero s. And so x dot mu is equal to zero, 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 one. Okay. <clears throat> so now this becomes, this becomes constant, this projector. But I still have a problem that this guy theta i Sorry, when I said that this depends on the, on, the, on the loop, I also meant to say that this guy depends on the loop in general. Theta i depends on s. So, okay, this is enough, of course, to get rid of the problem here. To get rid of a problem here, let's take theta i equal to constant. And just by um, our symmetry, I can take this constant to be, uh, this constant vector to be uh, one, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six. This guy, okay? So when I do that, <clears throat> so P plus and minus become S independent. And so I got, uh, I got, uh, I've got a, a Wilson, a Wilson line, which is one over n, trace, but ordering, exponent. So now the, the line has to be infinitely extended, otherwise it wouldn't be gauge invariant. So this, this, this is the, what we find. And this guy is uh, half EPS. So by this uh, language, we mean that he preserves half of the epsilons. And so let's, let's, let's check that this is the case. 
So we can take s separately epsilon bar, epsilon bar Q, <coughs> P minus. So this preserves eight components of epsilon Q. Or we could take epsilon bar equal to epsilon bar S, X nu, gamma nu, P minus. And this preserves eight component of ES, the way to see it, because now, so this guy actually is just P plus X nu, gamma nu. So it goes, goes through, changes sign, but that's, that's always a, a still half rank projector. So we have eight, Q, eight epsilon Qs and eight epsilon Ss, so we preserve in total 16 supercharges, and this is why we call it half VPS, because the vacuum has 32 supercharges. Well, I, I didn't really, I, I didn't do the counting, but <laughs> early, early this morning there were more complicated countings than this one, so I, I, I assume that you can do this count. Sorry, how did you find this? What? Yes, I put the formula in P and then I commute the gamma appearing here through this gamma and it's still a, it's still a P. No, I mean, the, the, the opening, the opening, I mean, you, you, you use the, the last the last form of P. Yeah, I, I, always, I, I always want to use, so epsilon bar has to be of this form, yeah. where this is constant. Right, right. I, I specialize P. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't write it down. Sorry. Um, yes, so P plus minus in this, uh, sorry, yeah, I was supposed to do it. P plus minus is uh, 1 over square root of 2, 1 plus minus I, gamma 4, gamma 5, rho 1. So you, you see it's, uh, it's uh, S independent, it's very simple, and you can. The other, the other, the conformer, uh, Spino, you, you have to know. It's not, a, it's not really a class type. The one that takes new gamma. So they, they, they have, uh, so in, it, so it has to be of this, so epsilon, it has to be an epsilon Q plus epsilon S X new gamma new. But for this very simple case of the line, I can, turn off one or turn off the other separately and, and I find that they are separately solutions. But now, as I guess Leo was alluding to, this is not always uh, so, so the case. Sometimes you have to consider all of them at the same time. Yes? Uh, is this just a reduction of a whistle loop in 10 dimensions or not? So there is something more. Um, because in 10 dimension, I probably only have super right? But in 10 dimension, it wouldn't be super. Oh, 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 okay, you mean. Because I'm a bit confused. It seems that everything comes from a reduction, right? Like having a line in 10 dimension. Uh, yeah, but I guess in 10 dimension, it would still be locally supersymmetric only. And this is really a question of having it uh, rigidly uh, invariant. I think it, yeah, it inherits some local supersymmetry from the 10-dimensional one, but uh, um, I think that's not enough. You have to impose, uh, you still have to impose rigid supersymmetry. Yeah. I'm confused a bit about the counting, because in the end, you said you are in so then you don't have Majorana light, Um, so, Q and S, epsilon Q and epsilon S, they are 16, is 16 components, constant components each, and P plus minus, they kill half of them, right? 
so you go, you, you get. <coughs> I mean Euclidean. Um, what, do, what do you mean? No, I'm, Um, yeah, so I don't know. So the question is uh, if it is really eight uh, real plus eight real or if it is complexified uh, so I, okay, may, maybe you can switch, you can vic rotate from uh, in, intermediate, uh, but I, I f I'm not sure. The straight line you can do in Lorentz can do. Yeah, the straight line you can do in Lorentz and put it on a on a on a on a sp space direction, and uh, I think nothing changes. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't see the difference. Okay, so uh, okay, this was one solution. It's the most obvious solution. But now, you, if you think in terms of uh, conformal transformations, so, so the second solution, you see that the line is conformally related to a circle uh, via an inversion. So let's take a circle in the 3, 4 plane. So x mu is 0, 0, cosine of s, sine of s. And theta i is the same, the same vector. Now uh, x dot, so a is equal to epsilon a, b, x, b, a, b are 3, 4. Now gamma a, gamma 5 becomes minus epsilon a, b, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma b. So if you write down your projectors, you discover that they have this form, 1 plus minus i, gamma 1, gamma 2, rho 1, x, b, gamma b. So now you see that these, these projectors are no longer as independent because, uh, because uh, you have this piece here that didn't go away. Still depends on S. But they have a very specific form. So if you take epsilon bar equal to epsilon 0 bar B minus, this is epsilon 0 bar, 1 minus I, gamma 1, gamma 2, rho 1, X B gamma B and you can write it as uh, so this is this becomes epsilon bar Q plus epsilon bar S X mu gamma mu. So even though the projector is not as independent, so you get uh, you get a super conformal Killy spinner with the right form where now this this guy is just epsilon zero, and this guy is uh, epsilon zero minus i gamma one, gamma two rho one constant. So now again you get uh, you get uh, uh, a half rank condition. So you preserve half of a component of epsilon, but now they are mixed. So the uh, uh, you can turn it off. At, you can turn it off epsilon zero bar. Otherwise, you cancel all of them. So this is again one half VPS. Okay. So these are the two simplest examples. Uh, so they preserve sixteen supercharges, either eight Qs and eight S separately, or a combination of them. 
but okay, this is very simple because essentially we are, are using constant, constant uh, thetas. So we take a, a, very, a very simple contour in this internal space, which is actually just a point. So in this internal space, the loops sits at a point. It always, couple, it always couples to the same, to the same scalar. You can you can go to S four and then this would be like the equator of S four. Oh, so the line. Uh, well, the line. Um, no, not really, because the line would have trivial expectation. I, I think on the S. Okay, on the S4 you have this half EPS operator, which is the, which is the equator the, 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 the equator of the S4. Yes. Yeah, you can think if you can think of it as coming from the line in, in R4, I guess. But yes. The, the variation of the exponent has to cancel. Yeah. No, it's not uh, necessary. It's sufficient in this particular example, as I said. In some other cases, it's not, it's not sufficient. So this is a special Well, yeah, I mean, it's just like I, I have this theory and I have to propose some operator. It's not written anywhere what is the algorithm to get the operator, so I, I have to do an ansatz and I have to check that it works. And this is what I've done. Yeah. Then you discover a new theory like ABJM, you try to do the same operation and it doesn't really work. So you, you get an operator which doesn't preserve half of supercharges, preserves less than that. And then you start thinking, okay, how do I get the one that preserves half of the supercharges? And then you have to find a different, a different trick. Okay, so I got, uh, I got uh, two minutes. So now let me give you a third example. So, so far, theta i was constant, but this is not necessary. So I can take a theta i, which depends on s. So the scalar coupling changes along the loop. And uh, so, for example, let, let's take, so uh, there, are, there are many operators that you can build this way, but let me focus on a particular class, which is, uh, uh, let me take a sphere, S2 in R4, and now let me, now this, this loop is confined, so this loop C is confined to be on the sphere. So let's take x4 equal to 0, xi equal to 1, 2, 3 as a unit vector. So this is a function of s. So xs squared is equal to 1. OK, so <coughs> of course, uh, well, this is not in general supersymmetric unless I do something with this, uh, so I have to tune them in a particular way. And, um, and this is, uh, this is uh, uh, something that you can do. Okay, so, <clears throat> Now you see that the scalar coupling is non-trivial, is, uh, is not a constant theta. As I, go, I, as I go along the loop, I change the coupling to the scalars, okay? And, uh, uh, um, 
e, so there is an exercise two in the problem setting which you can check with this guy is uh, uh, generically 1.8 PPS. So the way to see it, you, you're going to see that, okay, you try with the answer epsilon zero times a projector, but then you see that this is not generically in a super conformal killing spinner form. So you, it doesn't look like epsilon plus epsilon gamma x nu gamma nu because there are extra terms. And you can cancel these extra terms if you impose, if you impose further conditions on the epsilon zero. So instead of just killing half of the supersymmetry, you killed actually one eighth of them. So, so, uh, so sorry, you, you, you preserve only one eighth of them in, instead of preserving half because you impose three conditions in general. So you impose the projection plus two extra conditions which are also half rank conditions and you, you reduce by one eighth. But, and this is going to be interesting for the last lecture, there are cases so you, you give me any contour, C, like this, on the sphere. If it is built like this, this is generically 1.8 one BPS. But you can consider, so this contour, of course, is, is irregular. It doesn't have any, any nice symmetry. You can consider nice contours, like, for example, instead of taking something generic, you can, you can take some latitude. So you have some, a latitude at an angle theta zero. So this is more symmetric, of course, because there's some azimuth angle that is, uh, there's invariance under this thing. And you are going to see that actually one of the extra conditions that you have to impose drops. So instead of having one eight BPS, this is one quarter BPS. Of course, you can go back to the circle by taking theta zero equal to pi over two, then you go to the equator. And uh, again, you have some, you have some uh, cosine of theta zero multiplying some constraint, and when theta zero is a pi over two, becomes uh, zero, and then that constraint drops, and you go back to the one half PPS uh, uh, Wilson loop. Or some other, so this is going to reappear during the last uh, lecture. So this is called the latitude. Okay, another nice contour is if you take two meridians, two semi, circles meeting at some angle. So this is like a wedge, like a orange wedge. And so this is also one quarter BPS. Okay, and there are a few operators which are one quarter BPS. In general, they are one eight BPS, okay? And so, uh, so this is a, a construction in exercise two. That's also an exercise one in which uh, um, you have another construction of Wilson loops called Zarembo's loops, uh, which uh, can also be obtained from this class by some limiting procedure and um, uh, are also interesting. And uh, it's very nice, actually, it's very easy to check, to check, to, to understand uh, how the counting of supersymmetry uh, works in this case. So let me stop here. And so tomorrow we are going to do, we are going to evaluate this, this object, so the expectation value of this object.